Jordan, question for you, because this is something that I'm kind of struggling with in regard to the Democratic Party. So the main you know, campaign platform for Biden is gonna be and has been, Donald Trump is a threat to our dem democracy. He wants to dismantle our democratic process. He doesn't believe in the peaceful transition of power, which he did prove <laughs> in 2020, but and 2021 with January 6th. But when you have a democratic establishment that d does not allow for a robust primary process, does that kind of take a little bit of that argument away from Biden? Do you think by the time the general comes around, everyone will have forgotten about some of the maneuvering we've seen from the DNC? I don't know. I, I don't know if it's necessarily the process that people will be upset with. Mm -hmm. It's you know the the free exchange of ideas, yeah, like that we were deprived of. I don't think it, still within that context. I don't think it's a process question. I think it's going to be an enthusiasm problem. Yeah, because they're going in with somebody who. Doesn't have charisma, admittedly. No Riz. I mean, <laughs> you know, Rizless <laughs> Joe is going into November with, with young people, people of color, marginalized groups skewing toward not showing up, or in some cases, God forbid, I mean, but you were seeing this a lot with, with Latino voters skewing toward Trump. That's really dangerous, especially with his immigration policy. But their coalition in 2020 was built on young people and people of color mm -hmm. showing up. Wanting to oust Trump, but also wanting things addressed, wanting problems addressed, and wanting their material needs addressed. And you know that led them to victory. They had a couple years. The book, The Truce, by Hunter Walker and Lupe Lupin, I just finished it a couple weeks ago. They did a really good job talking about the first two years of the the Biden administration and how Ron Klain worked weekly, meeting with Jayapal, meeting with progressives, and helping shape. A lot of this policy keeping progressives in the loop. Jeff Zients replaces Klain, that relationship is totally severed. They're out on ice and Jayapal's left there like, what do we do? We might have millions of people watching this show, but you can be the difference maker because we just need 1% of our audience to be paid members and then this show can be around forever. So you can make that difference, click join now. Well, the change, because I noticed the change within Biden's term, right? It was very noticeable once Ron Klain had left the Biden White House. Yeah. And look, today it was announced that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau under Biden is capping credit card fees at 8%. And I wanna give Biden credit for that. I don't think that it's enough to really reinvigorate the Democratic base, namely the young voters that he absolutely does need the support of in order to win the general. I'm just worried that Biden waited a little too long to take the vulnerabilities of his campaign and his candidacy seriously, you know? I, I think there's still quite a bit of time. There's quite a few months, there's a lot of different news cycles. Um, that doesn't mean that there's good reason to believe that he'll use those all that well. But they, he's been making some moves, even in the area, both him and, and the vice president, you know, trying to reassure people a little bit about a change of stance in terms of Gaza. Like so, at least they seem to be hearing. And by the way, when I mention, you know, then you know what Biden's need, Biden needs to like lock John Kirby up in mm -hmm. a basement somewhere because mm -hmm. literally today he was asked during a presser by by a reporter, you know, now that it's abundantly clear that Israel is blocking humanitarian aid into Gaza, does that mean that the Biden administration is going to reconsider sending military aid to Israel mm -hmm. and the IDF? And they're like, no, we're gonna send them the weapons they want, no matter what. No, no, I actually think you should keep him <laughs> because he seems crazy. So you stand next to him, you seem reasonable by comparison. <laughs> so I think it's a good strategy. Uh, what I was saying previously about, you know, it would have been great to have like a real primary. And honestly, it would have been great to have more of a real primary on the Re Republican side as well. Uh, like automatically, a lot of people who ultimately want Biden to be the candidate think, well, you're only saying that because you want him to be beat. And look, ideally, I. I could list some names that I think would be better if they were the candidate. But I've been trying to make the case, obviously unsuccessfully in all of my like live streams responding to election results, that even if you want Biden to be the candidate, 
you should want a primary for a lot of different reasons. And like through no fault of your own, you're being drawn into this thing that is almost always true of Democrats, particularly centrist Democrats, that they're terrified of elections and primaries. They're terrified of attention. They're terrified of having any focus on what they're doing, what they say, what they believe. And the thing about a primary where there's multiple people duking it out is that can generate coverage. And you pointed out that the DNC has denied us an actual primary, but I would put like 40% of the blame on the media. Who just decided, no, it's not happening. We're literally never going to acknowledge it. We're gonna give a thousand town halls to Mike Pence and Chris Christie and Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy of all people. But we're gonna pretend that Biden isn't facing any challengers. And thus, there's no coverage of what I assume a lot of Biden supporters think, Biden trouncing his opponents. Instead, what do you have? More critical coverage of Biden in other areas, including his mental competency. Well, what if he were to go on the debate stage and like destroy Marianne Williamson, then maybe that would reassure some people of his mental competency. And it would get some coverage of democratic ideas. They could all be pitching bold visions for the future. People could get jazzed about the possibility of a second term. Even if you love Biden, you should have wanted a primary, especially because as the incumbent with a billion dollars behind him, he was almost certainly gonna win it no matter what anyway. But at least there would have been some coverage. I think it's worth mentioning that you know, the outcome of the primary election seems predetermined because it was obvious almost from the very beginning that we're gonna be left with the same two candidates, Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden. But the reasons are different for Republicans versus Democrats. Mm -hmm. For Democratic voters, Biden was kind of forced upon them. Whereas with Trump, the reason why it feels like there isn't really much of a primary is because of how fired up Trump's base is and how fired up Republican voters are in their support for Trump. So that's, there's a significant difference there. There's a lot of excitement behind Trump in the Republican Party. That's not the case mm -hmm. when it comes to Biden and the Democratic Party. And that already puts Democrats at a huge disadvantage when it comes to the general. Yeah. You know, And there's poll after poll showing just how vulnerable Biden is. One of the most concerning things that came up in, in recent polling was that about 10% of voters who cast their ballots for Biden in 2020 do not plan to do so this time around. I mean, that's worrying. It was a yeah. close race in 2020. We're, I think we're all thankful that Trump was, was ousted, but you're banking on a situation where the Democratic Party, Biden's campaign, they're saying, oh, this polling is wrong. Mm -hmm. The polling showing Biden doing poorly is wrong. It's been wrong the past couple of cycles. And there's a kernel of truth within that. Yeah. Polling is right now fundamentally broken because so many people don't answer unknown phone numbers. I get it. But you shouldn't bank all your hopes on polling being wrong. Like <laughs> overall, you can tell like some things might happen. Like they kind of predicted the the specificity was wrong, but they predicted that the Democrats would lose the House. Not a bold prediction, but right now, like we we can see, we can feel it. We don't see the enthusiasm for Biden. We don't see it from young people who are the key to victory, an ever growing voting bloc in this country. And to your point. Trump is still turning out huge rallies, huge crowds, people are, are engaged. They feel part of something bigger than themselves. That is a, a really important part of politics and especially electioneering. I totally agree, especially feeling like the election, there's something that you're part of that's bigger than yourself. Like mm -hmm. that's how I personally felt when it came to Bernie Sanders. And that was the last time I felt genuinely fired up about our electoral process and an, and an election. Um, but you know, this time around we didn't really get any real options because I mean, the, like the fact that the state of Florida did not even allow for a Democratic primary to take mm -hmm. place, it's just ludicrous. I just find it, it's offensive to me. Yeah. And anti democratic. Yeah. And you, and you sort of alluded to it there, but earlier you did as well. Like, if, if you're going to center defense of and veneration for democracy as like, this is the now the value of the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. and we'll demonstrate that by the fact that we're opposing Donald Trump. Everybody gets really mad when you say, well, then shouldn't we have some democracy? And they're like, well, why are you saying it's the same? I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying it's the same as doing a coup or sacking the Capitol, but it would be so easy to just do the democracy thing. To not, and again, like I said before, Biden is almost certainly gonna win anyway. Do you need to avoid 
the, the Florida primary. I think there was one other one where they sort of rigged it in the same way. Like, you don't even have to. This is like totally voluntary authoritarianism. Like, it's not it's even ridiculous. necessary. Yeah. And it's not the same thing. I'm not saying it's the same thing. And if you think that I go easy on Donald Trump or whatever, like, nice to meet you. But, like, it just, it's not necessary. We could have an actual exchange of ideas. We could have Biden going on a stage once or twice. Defending his record or whatever. And even look, recently, mm -hmm. there's even some good economic news, you know, more good unemployment numbers or whatever. There's actually wage growth, you know, that the numbers that were pretty positive over the last couple of months and the inflation numbers aren't as bad as they were. Like, that's a great thing for you to boost if you have a venue for it. But when you're not doing the debates, when you're not even doing like the Super Bowl interview, like, you better hope that people hear us talking about it, That's I guess, because so you're not going to hear it from Joe Biden all that much. That's such a devastating point. Yeah, and unless you're in the ice cream parlor with him, maybe you'll overhear him talking about it. I don't know. I hadn't actually thought of it from that perspective, but that's such a good point. I mean, the primary debates, for instance, and the primary campaigning gives the candidate an opportunity to showcase what, especially the incumbent, showcase what he has accomplished during his presidency. And I do think that one of the issues with Democrats in general has been messaging, but with Biden, that problem is on steroids mm -hmm. yeah. because of the way that uh, the Democratic primaries this time around have played out, and how certain you know efforts to even have a primary were squashed in certain states like Florida.